welcome to the Dwarven Tavern. I am your host, Lyric, and today we are exploring the Shadows of Estrin Travels book. This is a continuation of the series of Shadows of Estrin. Surprise, surprise. Uh, done by a Gate RPG or Forge Songs. You can find them at their respective websites. But uh, this is a role-playing game of horrific and gothic influence. Uh, which means it's not your stereotypical fantasy RPG. It's got a little more darkness in the mix. So this book is kind of, I equate it to this RPG system, Dungeon Master's Guide. It's a little more, it, it's different than that, but it's, it's kind of the same feel that it's got. Uh, I think these are called narrators or authors. I can't remember what the, the game master is called in this system. They're called leaders. I had to search for it real quick. <laughs> so the leaders uh, the, use this book in order to guide the rest of the campaign, or the explorers of shadows, along the Tricastle and all of the different places that you can go. So the book starts off with, let's flip back to the beginning, uh, it goes straight into the chapter one, which is cartography. And that's where it has noteworthy places of the Tricausal, uh, which is Gwydra, Rej, Rez, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Talcair, and other places. Uh, the fun thing about this book is they actually included in the index a pronunciation guide. So I'm very, very happy with that because this is a mixture, like all of the words in here, all the names are mixtures of both Gaelic and French. So it is a little hard for an American like me to pronounce, um, which is kind of embarrassing to say, but it like, I, I'm actually a polyglot. I speak several different languages and some of these pronunciations are still pretty hard for someone who has language experience. So then including a pronunciation guide just makes it that much better. So going into chapter one, this, it starts off with a note to the young explorers that we are, and uh, it describes uh, what this chapter is about. It has people, populations, and journeys, and all of the individual parts have things that you can include into your game. So the first part, it describes it as the note from Eldred Feard, which is right here. Then noteworthy places of the Tricastle, which are 10 noteworthy places in the peninsula, uh, such as the lines of Tersal, Ashen Yard, the religious city of expiation, so on and so forth. And then it goes into traveling, because as a traveler, that's what you do. And then it includes a helpful little section of sailing, which I feel is left out a lot in RPGs. So another good point for them. So we're gonna go to Gwydra, or Guidra, again, my pronunciation is terrible. And uh, we're going to read a section of one of these noteworthy places. I have found that these individual places are kind of like story hooks to get you going in a campaign. Like if you have no real idea where you wanna start in the scenario, it actually gives you several places that you can choose from. and. Uh, not only that, but it actually gives you an explanation of why this is a place that you want to check out. So I'm going to read a short little excerpt right here uh, called Calvary. And they've got different sections all over this spread, but I'm going to go with this one. It says, I have been told that four monasteries have been built on this island. I know nothing about what may take place there. And like many people, I have heard of a prison or citadel built by the crown of Gwydra. However, there is nothing to validate such a rumor about this place, or the stories mentioning important prisoners kept there. Uh, bah, bah, bah. So, like, that alone is enough to keep interest, and like, hey, maybe if we go there, there is a prisoner that we need to talk to about this certain thing that leads to this place that, you know, spiels a whole gigantic story. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different places that you can go to, and again, the artwork never fails in this book. Like, Shadows of Estra have, like, they've got amazing artists, so. Then the next place is the Rej, or the Rays. Uh, it does not have a pronunciation guide for that in the back of the book. Um, I'm probably gonna stick with Rage, um, because the H often, when given in phonetics, is a je noise. 
So the next place has the pretty much the same thing. Um, it has different excerpts that can lead a story on. Uh, we're going to go with Eagle's Peak this time. The legendary eagles of Rage's highest peak are mentioned in the Chronicles of Arenfell, who even describes one of these majestic birds, claiming that it could have carried away an adult goat effortlessly. Unfortunately, these fabled birds seem determined to stay up there, and getting closer to them would require climbing very steep cliffs. So that could be a story where you take a bunch of, I believe they're called Vargals in this world, um, ranger type adventurers where they explore the wilderness. You take a couple of those guys out and find the eels that are on Raja's highest peaks. Yeah, that could lead to some very interesting campaigns. So the next one is a tell care. Uh, again, we're just gonna take a small excerpt because, you know, these are really cool things and I want you to, to check it out for yourself. I don't wanna spoil it all for you, so I'm just gonna take a snippet from each uh, of the individual noteworthy places. So this one is the Fool's Spring. I was advised not to drink from it, since those who do turn mad or fall into a coma until death comes. However, I took some of the water from the spring and had it sent to an alchemist friend in Calvernach. He replied that it was perfectly healthy and held no particular property, which does not explain why no bird or no other animal from Cairns Island ever drinks from it. Again, bum bum bum. Every single part of this, uh, of these noteworthy places has the hook that gets you interested. It has a mystery which can be explained by either further reading of the book or a, you know, creative DM or leader, excuse me. And uh, it can lead to stories that can, you know, hold interest for a long time. And since these are story hooks, they kind of can lead into one another. Like for example, if you start at the full spring, you may end up at Caradagus, uh, which I'll read that one too. A quite important burg whose woodwork is famed in the region, particularly in Kel Loir. The huge Magiantis machinery, set not far from the outer wall, easily catches the eye. Its builder is doing his best to convince the inhabitants of the benefits of his science can bring. Could those be related? Who knows? Maybe the runoff of his machinery is causing the well to be contaminated. Maybe the contaminated well is something that his machinery is working around. Who knows? So then it goes to other places. Uh, these are places that may not necessarily have um, regions that they belong to. And uh, again, these are more like story hooks. And considering like the good part of chapter one is these story hooks, there's a lot of material that you can work with here. So we're gonna go to Cliffs of No Return. They are said to be imposing and impassable. Sailing through the ill-famed Seamus Rounds to go and check that myself holds no appeal to me, so someone else will have to show bravery on this precise point. Still, many stop at nothing to venture into the mythic continent. Ooh. Again, this book is kind of written, it's not kind of written, it is s partially written by the Eldred Feared. Uh, the chronicler at the beginning of the book. He's listing out all these places for you so that you can go check them out yourselves. He basically did all the dirty work for you. Uh, then the next part of this chapter is actually different places that aren't in the Tricastle. For example, the Lines of Tursal, the Ashen Yard, uh, the Expiation and the Pilgrim's Way. So the places that I mentioned earlier, um, all of these different places uh, go into some sort of explanation of, of what you can find there and what you can do. Again, the artwork and the, the display of the book is also intriguing. It's not just the fact that the artwork is pretty. It's written and displayed like a notebook or a journal and uh, keeps interest because it's not just it's not just a, a interesting read. It's also fun to look at, and I find a lot of RPGs can be pretty boggling or heavy with information, and it can be you know kind of hard to get through and enjoy because there's just no interest in looking at it. So the way that this book is set up keeps the reader entertained and intrigued for pages and pages of information. Like again, here is a, another clip of that, and it's looking, it's looking pretty good. 
I like it. I like it quite a lot. So I think, you know, display alone is an axe. So I don't want to skip over all of this information because it is a lot of information, but it is pretty interesting. And I don't want to leave you, you know, with not a, a good enough review. So we're going to check out the, the Regite Rivers. And just I'm just going to read tidbits from the book. Uh, to give you a good idea of what you can expect from these particular sections. Because of its many waterfronts, Tri Castle is regularly drenched by rain or covered with snow during winter. When it thaws during spring or when rainfalls are more frequent, the streams originating from the mountains at the center of the peninsula swell, sometimes causing dangerous floods. No map shows all of the rivers, lakes, and streams of the peninsula. There are far too many of them, and their flows can vary dramatically from one season to another. The most extreme cases are the streams that suddenly turn into tumultuous, destructive torrents by the storm. A storm. Their courses change through the years due to topographic changes and erosion. So, that's something I didn't know. The tri has apparently really bad rain and really bad rivers, and these can be really dangerous. And that's probably why there is a sailing section, aside from the fact that the tri is kind of like an island. Um, or it's, you know, it's, it's surrounded by water, except for the top. Um, but the, like, there's a lot of water that you have to mess with in this region. Uh, and then it actually, the next part of it is describing the different types of rivers life that you can uh, encounter, for example, whirlpools or fords or floods and swells, things that can make the adventure a little more difficult. Um, for example, the whirlpool, we'll just read that one. Often invisible from the surface, whirlpools can swallow an adult and are the cause of many drownings. A feet roll ranging from 14 to 17 can be required to swim away from one. Wow, that could kill your character so easily. <laughs> Dangerous areas can be deceptively close to more peaceful spots where children play during the summer. So rumors of children going missing by the river, it doesn't necessarily have to be a kappa, it could be a whirlpool. <laughs> so that is just a small tidbit of the different places that you can look into. Uh, it includes, uh, like, there's actually a timeline here. Um, that is the line tied to the destiny of a city, and it actually gives dates where the certain things happen, and you can, you know, look back a uh, hundred years, almost, uh, 60, 60 years, of information that build with content. So, that's a lot of information that I am just gonna skip on over because I want you to get this book and read it for yourself. So, the next part is traveling. So, traveling is important because you are travelers. And this is a kind of a guide of what you can expect from uh, the, the lands here. It also gives, I'll get into that in a minute, but like a hobo code. So, for example, um, some estimates for journeys in Tricazel. If you're walking on foot over land, uh, that would take about three miles to get somewhere in an hour. The chart below provides estimates of the distance traveled per hour. In normal conditions, one can travel for 10 hours a day, but leaders are free to amend this, particularly as regions, uh, re as regards to the weather. So if it's one of those famous tri bursts of rain, probably can't get there in three miles probably have to take it 1.5 or maybe one depending on how bad the torrent is if you're in the swamp going by carriage it'll take you point it'll take you an hour to get 0.5 miles so it's going to be a little more difficult in the swamp than it would be uh, in the mountain by carriage or let's do uh, mountain by horse which is 4.5 miles in an hour so all of these it, it gives a nice little chart of all these different variables that you can do travel by, which is so useful because I have such a hard time gauging distance. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's helpful a lot, especially for someone like me. And on top of that, it gives little notes at the bottom. Uh, for example, traveling on foot with heavy gear, uh, such as heavy armor chain mail or bulkier several weapons, uh, or large pack complete with tent and a f or just a few examples, have the day's progression. So it cuts all your progress in half. 
The force march discipline, described later in this chapter, can cancel this penalty. I'm going to assume that the force march is someone who knows how to travel with such heavy equipment. Probably a feat of sorts. So it goes on to describe hazards. There are a few different types of hazards. There's wandering, disease, and despair. Wandering is, uh, for example, you have, you know, problems that you have to overcome, such as fog or mist, uh, maybe a tempest or dark forest. There's disease, such as yellow fever, uh, stomach flu, uh, la la la, certain foods that you could eat that can make you have an upset stomach. Despair, you being alone or wounded, um, you, you know, just have morale problems, like things that can, you know, make any adventurer despair and sad. <laughs> uh, maybe a party member died. Maybe you had to leave a love behind. Maybe you weren't so lucky in your last encounter. Um, these are things that you have to really include in your travels. And uh, because this is a gothic style of book, it takes on a little more gritty, serious perspective. The next part is the help of a Varigal, which I said Vargal earlier, and that was a mistake on my part. I was reading my notes off to the side, and I misspelled it. So, Varigal. <laughs> Varigals are specialists in traveling, and not only because they have striven to reach excellence in this field. They share bits of rare knowledge amongst themselves. It should be amongst, not among. But I think these guys are French. So I am willing to excuse typos because this is a gigantic book of information and, you know, making typos is just, you know, I can forgive that. Uh, and form in the tricastle a solid, solidary, albeit relatively informal, group. So Varigals are not only travelers, but they also are uh, kind of a band of people, um, even if they've never met, because they, they've got this uh, society of their own. They have a, a formal clique that they can be a part of. Um, for example, um, they identify themselves in different ways depending on the region. In Osog territories, the custom is to exchange a few key sentences in the ancient tongue. In Rage, bearing a tattoo on the underside of the wrist is starting to become widespread. The aim of this practice is to counter the difficult difficulties caused by fake varigals. Indeed, how can you prove you are a true Varigal? By deciphering a stir mark, those marks that only Varigals can read. But what makes the client certain that this interpretation is not mere invention? The tattoo, shaped like a coat of arms inspired by the style of the stir marks, and indicating spiritual affiliation, is an attempt by Rajite Varigals to create a proof that it is genuinely belong to the order. It is somewhat effective, but experienced impersonators are still able to bypass such precautions. So, Varigals apparently really hold high their own coat of arms, and I guess that makes sense because you don't want information spreading that is true or, or not true and dangerous. Um, the, the information that has to go through has to be uh, concise and specific. And if someone were to get into that, the cogs of the machine would mess up. And uh, it kind of reminds me of this book that I love. And um, it's totally off topic, but it's uh, The Giant Slayer by Ian Lawrence. And it's one of my favorites. It's a book about a girl who has friends in the Polio Award. And she describes a story that um, has the main character, the Giant Slayer. Uh, he grew up in a tavern and travelers come through this tavern and share stories and give information. And he creates this mental map of all these different places so that when he eventually goes out on his own travels, he feels like he's been there before because he's told these stories all his childhood and he retains the information and is able to make his way through the wilderness even though he's never been there before. So I think that's pretty cool. So the Sturmarks are a really cool part of this book. I love them dearly. I think they are pretty cool to include. Um, I equated them to the Hobo Code, um, or Hobo Hieroglyphics, as I've heard them called. Uh, basically, they're markings that Varigals use to help determine if a place is safe, or if it is a place that you should avoid, or has dangerous things in there. Uh, for example, this one right here is called Fangs, and it is something that announces danger, more precisely a dangerous predator that has settled nearby. 
by itself, this sign has insufficient. Is insufficient for Varigal, since a grizzly may only spend one winter in a cave. Uh, this is the reason why a second symbol announcing the nature of the danger is added. Most of these messages are only drawn with chalk or okra. No reason to worry colleagues with a danger that died years ago. So, if you see, that would be one way to tell if a Varigal had actually marked that place. If it was by itself, or if it was done in something a little more permanent, then maybe a Varigal didn't draw that. Who knows? Or, maybe the danger is so fierce <laughs> that it needed a more permanent thing, which again, you know, I am usually play a ranger type, so I can understand why uh, something a little more uh, temporary would be necessary. Um, another one, we'll just go with uh, shelter. That one's a pretty easy one. It's a little owl. Uh, the nearby presence of a hole or cave, a ruin in decent condition, basically a place where people can spend the night without fearing for the safe their safety or being harassed by bad weather. So if you see an owl uh, in like by a cave side, you know that that cave isn't inhabited by the fangs. <laughs> Or uh, maybe the, uh, the abandoned shelter has a sturdy enough roof where the, the torrents that we mentioned earlier are not so bad. So that's pretty nice. I like that a lot. Uh, here is a little something that I did like. Um, storytelling a journey is really important. About to get real talk right now. Storytelling in a, a journey is really important for the Dwarven Tavern. We really enjoy role playing our stories. Um, we like having rules, but we've We've come to the conclusion that we like to do our RPGs as stories that we write that we sometimes have to roll dice for. Having a game that is a little more serious, a little more in depth, and something that is more engrossing than the average campaign is extremely important. And, you know, having at least one of those can really spice up your game night. So this little ex excerpt right here is something that I, I'm really happy that they included. By carefully choosing what they are going to stage, leaders can give travels a true meaning that will make the narration richer while avoiding the pitfall of fastidious or repetitive scenes. Here are a few tools and tips to make each journey interesting and intense. So what that is, is for example, giving a meaning to the instant. Shadows of Estrin is a gothic game and as such relies on certain romantic tendency in descriptions. It means that the atmosphere of the place and the choice of the weather, like anecdotes drawn from the environment, have a meaning. They are part of a narrative principle. The art of description is then to draw inspiration from the real elements, to choose few details that will put forward the express the whole and, above all, a state of mind. So, that's a little bit of information that you can take with you as you go through this game. Um, it, you know, gives a description of what it's what Dawn is talking about. Um, like, Dawn is a beginning, but nothing ensures that the rest of the day will be promising as its start. That alone is enough information to go off of for that. Um, you know, it, it can be foreboding, or, uh, you know, something could take a turn for the worse, or a turn for the better. Uh, you never know, because the day is something that is unpredictable. Uh, the next part of this is perceiving the world through the senses. Uh, this is something that is also extremely important. Uh, you're in a game, and being in the game means you have to be immersed in order to feel like you're truly getting the most out of it. If you're not, then you're not going to enjoy it. So it gives a little description of what you should be mindful of with the, the different senses. Tuts and balance, hearing, sight, taste, and smell. Um, these are things that can affect the game and make it feel a little more real and entertaining. Um, especially for newbies. Like, if they're not experienced, this may be something... Like, a gothic game may be up someone's alley, but they might not know how to get it at first. So, in order to really delve into the experience, you have to include all of the senses and make sure that they're getting the most out of the experience. The next part is a subjective perception. Um, everybody has a tendency to immediately perceive what interests them and discard what they are indifferent to. The idea here is to present a few examples of this phenomenon as support uh, for the leaders. Take note of the skills in which your PC has a score of five or more to adapt your descriptions and maybe even anticipate the player's questions. In cases where a perception roll is made to spot something hidden, the roll may get a plus one or plus two bonus if things find 
if the thing to find relates to one of the interests of the PC. That is really important. That is, again, something that I find overlooked in a lot of RPGs. They tend to not include something that is uh, very specific to one player. Um, let's go with just, they have a whole list, but we're going to go with prayer. Susceptible to austere atmospheres, to the manifestations of one in cold or ice, but also everything beautiful in front of which they will feel grateful to their divine lord for gifting them with such a vision. They will quickly notice any geometrical patterns. That's pretty neat. Let's take another one. Uh, shooting. Careful of the wind that can deflect their projectiles and the phenomena that can impair sight, such as fog or smoke. Look out for opportunities to shoot wildfowl, etc. So, for example, if you have a Varigal who is used to hunting and they are going through a non-wooded area and they are walking through, they may be the ones to notice that there is way more wildlife in this area that should be. Um, mayhaps. They are the first to notice that people aren't in their housing. These are things that maybe very specifically he is, you know, not just notice, and you can send them notes or write them messages or something. Send them a text message on the table that they notice these things, and it creates a, a little more atmosphere for the game to go smoothly. Then it has Sailing in Tricazzle. Uh, again, this is a very important part of the book. A lot of people don't necessarily include sailing as part of their world because a lot of the lore is set on land. So I think this is a pretty awesome chapter, or part of the chapter, because this is still chapter one. So it has a very similar graph that it did with the, the traveling on land. For example, on a Coggin boat of crew of 10, uh, you have six passengers, three tons of I guess freight. I'm, I'm not I'm not knowledgeable about boats at all, so if I say something dumb right now, that's why. It is 20 FD, which they have a specific type of currency in this world. I think those are called frost something? Frost? I know, I know they're frost something. Dells, that's what they're called. Frost dells, azure dells, and ember dells. So, um, these are 20 Frostels, or Wenting is one Frostel, um, so those are pretty expensive. Um, a Carrick, which has four masts, is an 80 crew, 100 passenger boat that is 60 tons and costs 900 Frostels. I can speak. I can do it. That's, that's pretty expensive. Uh, specified on page 223 of book one, a room aboard a boat generally costs about two or zero dowels for each day the journey takes. That would be pretty average, in all honesty. Um, if we're going with, uh, you know, fantasy expenses, uh, Azure Dells, I believe, would be the equivalent of uh, silver pieces. So silver, two silver pieces a night on a boat, yeah, that's pretty average. For a minimum of three Azure Dells, one may be given a private cabin, barely large enough for the person and traveling bag. Of course, this implies that the boat is big enough to have such accommodations. Uh, thus, only Carracks or a very large Coggin. A uh, loftier cabin can be as large as a captain's, but may be only available, may not be available on all ships, since such spaces generally kept for other uses. They are very thorough with this, um, per usual. I mean, this whole series, this whole uh, game system is very thorough with its information. So, um, shifting crafts and means for orientation. Um, this has, again, information that can be helpful. The Coggin. Since I mentioned that, we'll talk about that. To sail the sea, the Trichizalians have built sturdier boats, the Coggins, shallow draft coasters whose hulls curved progressively from the flat bottom toward the prow and the stern. Fitted with one and sometimes two masts, a Coggin can easily carry up to three tons of freight. I have sailed on one of such ship. Again, we're talking as the dude who was made the note at the beginning of the book. Um, they offer little comfort, and it takes a strong stomach to keep your lunch for more than a few minutes. Moreover, compared to Ostian sailboats, they are difficult to steer, as if the wood they are made of was reluctant to explore the waters surrounding them. Then it goes on to describe why sail? 
And it says, It's mainly to find sustenance that Trichazalians have ventured on the streams and rivers, then onto the oceans. The streams are full of fish, and you can find plenty of salmon and trout. I say salmon. It's just one of those things I do. A trout, common catfish, eels, and carp. You can also catch a few chars, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too, and tiger catfish, the latter being famous for its delicate flesh, which is served at a table of nobility and great occasions. So, uh, there is that, and that mostly seems to be the main reason to sail, is to fish. Um, of course, you know, this is kind of uh, an island-ish area, so sailing can also be done for just kind of getting from one side of the map to the other. So just looking in the first book, um, yeah, I'm pulling up the map of the hole that is the Tricastle so that you can see what I'm talking about because I've mentioned it a couple times. I'm really surprised that they don't have it in this book where I haven't found it yet. But uh, there is the whole map of the Tricastle. So there is a lot of water that is surrounding this area. So sailing is kind of an important part of living here, especially if you're an adventurer. Like you can go across the, the mountain peaks right there in the middle of the whole island, or you can just sail around, whichever is more dangerous. <laughs> also, as I was looking through this, um, it actually gives the, the markers that I was mentioning earlier, the different story hooks. Uh, like there are the Cliffs of No Return, Sea of Shrouds, the Calvary is over here. So you can actually find the places that you want to explore on this map, which if you're having this book, you should have this book too, because this is the um, kind of the the main book. It's called One Universe, so that's the player's handbook, basically. You should have this in your inventory anyway. So, um, with that said, it, it describes the individual bodies of water also, like the Sea of Shrouds, the main harbors, uh, toward the Cairns Islands, um, the Sejuars, um, all of those individual places, the Full Spring, the thing that I mentioned earlier. So what we're going to take a gander at it right now. Um, in Koskin, there are a handful of ferrymen who agreed to sail to the Cairns Islands outside the favorable period. They are all considered fools, liars, or madmen. They claim that they have drunk water from the Great Clear Pool located at the highest spot of the island dubbed the Fool's Spring. The isolated pond is consist constantly swept by cold winds howling between the labyrinth of rocks that mask it from sight. Only the terns, small birds with raven black feathers and strangely mournful screams endemic to the island, come to drink there. Full Spring. It's, it's probably named that for a reason. Don't go up there. It's dangerous, it's cold, it's wet, and it's full of screaming birds. <laughs> so why would you do that? And the chapter of the sea part ends, actually the whole chapter ends on the call of the open sea, where we're talking as the, the man at the beginning of the book. And I cannot remember his name for anything. It is Alfred, I think? Alf Alf Eldred. Eldredford. He is finishing the chapter by saying the call of the open sea, where he hopes to have not hid anything from you. Um, in that chapter and why it can be so uh, romanticizing to go sailing on a boat that doesn't even want to be on water. So chapter two is canvases. What are canvases you say? Canvases are actually tidbits. They are stories that you can uh, play. So if the story hooks weren't enough for you to get your game on, these are things that can actually hold your hand, I guess, in order to make the game flow. Um, each one of these, I think there are five in total, these are shorter scenarios that can help you explore the world with a guide, kind of. It's kind of like you have a secondary leader, um, one that is kind of pulling you along. So if you're very new to the system and you want to try it out, but no one you know has played it, and everyone else seems to be more confused than you are, you can be the leader and use this to your advantage. Let's go with the structure of the canvases. They have roots, trunk, branches, leaves, and wind. And each one of these have a different purpose. Uh, the first is roots, and it describes the origins and the underly underlying reason of the plot. The trunk is the details, the hearts of the action, and describes the way the PCs will be involved in the story. 
Branches are various alternatives and possible choices for both leaders and players. Leaves are the uh, follow-up, aftermath, or consequences of the story. And then the wind is the last section and to give tips for the atmosphere as well as musical suggestions so that the leaders can enhance the dramatic intensity of the game. Because if you know anything about the Dwarven Tavern, we always suggest that you include music in your games to hype up that scenario because without music, it's a game. With music, it's an experience. Each one of these stories has those individual parts so that you can really get the aspect of the game down. Uh, we will go with, I'm going to flip forward to A Night of Fright. We'll just, we'll just do this one because there's five in total. The style is a thriller. Setting is a desert mountain village. The season is early spring and it takes about two hours. <laughs> oh no, do they actually put time limits on these? Oh, that is, that is optimistic at the very least. Yeah, each one of these says about two hours long. Oh my goodness. Um, so if you've never played a game before, two hours is pretty, pretty generous. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't imagine playing a game that only lasted two hours. Most of our games don't even start like really getting into it for two hours. You have to put at least six hours aside to play a game. So if you wanted to sit down and do this in two hours, I'm like, you're trying really hard to make it happen that way. But I don't know, like this is a canvas, this is something that is supposed to be leading you along, so maybe it wouldn't take as long because it already has all of that information figured out for you. So, maybe, maybe I'd have to actually play one, which I totally might because, I mean, these are really interesting. We'll just do The Night of Fright. Um, we're gonna read the roots and then take it from there. The isolated village of Givon is Gevon is located a few miles from the extensive caverns. Two centuries ago, the Gevonians, Gevonians, uh, accents on the E, uh, assaulted by Feondas, uh, took shelter there. They discovered that in the past, the place had already been used as a shelter by others, and wall paintings even proved that such, use, such a use dated back to the times of the Argoin. Since then, every year on the first day of spring, the Gevonians completely desert their village, only leaving behind a few stabled animals that would be too difficult to take along. The whole community, led by their Demorten, which I was mispronouncing in my first review, um, it is French, so they don't pronounce the TH like the, it's te, so Demorten, go to the caverns for three days and three nights with weapons and food to symbolically commune with their ancestors while honoring the memory of the slaughter that occurred two centuries ago. Since the Vale is isolated and rather peaceful, there is virtually no risk of bandits or looters taking action during the few days when the inhabitants are absent. Even more so considering the weather is still quite bad at this time of year. Proof is, in 200 years, there has been no, almost no incident. Ooh, if that isn't a peak of interest, who would know? Yeah, then it goes on to describe um, a PC. Uh, the PCs have joined the caravan of a merchant, Master Verber. Um, I'm not going to read all of that because, again, these are giant blocks of information. So, um, yeah, you basically explore what is going on in Gevon. Gevon. I can do it. I can pronounce it. To describe what a Demorten is, is they are kind of like shamans. They are magic wielders in this world. Um, but magic is not quite like fireball and magic missile. It's more you are reaching across the veil and amassing supernatural powers and abilities and foresight and the like. So that's what a Demorten is. Um, they are magic wielders in the gothic sense of the word. Moving along, uh, we're gonna look at the music information that this gives. Uh, it says musical inspirations, Graham Revelle, The Insider, 09, I am alone on this. A track that is sure to set a heavy atmosphere during the exploration of the village. So they actually not only say, you know, you should play this type of song, they actually give the type of song that you should play, which that's very interesting, very rare. Then it goes on to chapter three. Chapter three is kind of like a canvas, but way more in depth. Um, it's if you want to start out with something that's a little more complicated. 
for example, it says the length is enough for a short campaign. So this is something that you really want to get into this campaign setting. Um, like you have the book, you're all set out, you got all the munchies in the world, and uh, you're ready to, to play an RPG. The style of this is a journey followed by an intrigue in an enclosed space before a slip toward survival and horror. The setting is na nature, town, then forest and mountains in Talcare, and then the seasons from the end of spring to summer when the roads and oceans are accessible. So this is, this is an in-depth campaign right here. And uh, I'm not going to get into it because it is, again, an in-depth campaign, but I will read you the individual parts. Um, they have a summary, prologue, chronicle markers, uh, getting the characters involved, modular scenario of systems in the shadows of Estrin, script and sandbox, horror and dramatic tension, um, like all of the information that you would really need in order to be the leader on this campaign. So the summary is, years after the death of her child and his father, a magentiest, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too, mother finds out that there is a disappearance at sea was a ploy to hide their kidnapping. The son and father now live in Talcare among a self-sufficient ultra-traditionalist community. Determined to stop at nothing, the mother organizes an expedition with the aim to finding her child and taking him away from the clutches of the dogmatic environment. The journey will be dangerous, but there is much more to fear from the village in from the village's inhabitants. I almost got through that whole thing. So, uh, basically, I guess you would be following this P NPC along and uh, helping her find her child. And, you know, don't play the game if you're not interested in doing that. Yes, so it says here that the, the Magiantist friend, uh, her name is Anai Klusek, I guess? is a teacher and researcher who is very involved in her professional life and has rather extensive web contacts, both friends and rivals. So uh, I'm guessing that is the NPC who will be the, the main person of the adventurer. So I believe that the, the Mudan is the village of the pure. That is the village that they are going to. It actually gives a description of everything that's going on there. For example, although most villages in the Tricasal survive, uh, strive to live self-sufficiently, some products are and know-how still require the contribution of outsider merchants and artisans. It gives mines and metal, cereals, clothing, life among the sect, Higher Mudan and its surroundings, Lower Mudan, and all of the information thereof to help really give an engrossed feeling of what is going on. You probably would have to read this beforehand before you got into your story just because there is so much information that you would have to process. So then it gives the NPC right here and says personalities and motivations. So Lady Anne Krusik. Um, she's a female Regite, 38 years old, a magientist, mineralist, and physician. Um, all of her information and a description of who she is. Um, then it describes a few more people that may be involved in the campaign. Um, for example, Eden the Sun. He is a young male, a Regite, 15 years old. Um, and he, uh, he gives a tiny little description of who he is, as well as Therion the Father who they are going after. So, uh, it even gives some villagers from the high, Higher Mudan, like people that you can include, smaller NPCs that may have something to do with the plot. And then it goes on to Act 1, how to actually start the scenario, which again, I'm not getting into because that's a lot of information. Um, it has scene 1, scene 2, scene 3. So scene 1 is the mother. Scene two is traveling. Scene three is an eerie forest. It tells everything about what's going on in those particular scenarios. Basically, you don't have to think to do this uh, scenario. It lays it all out for you. So, like, if you really want to get into the game and you have no idea where to start, you need to get this book because it, d it does it for you. It describes it on how to do it. Act two, knots and ties. Uh, scene everyday life in Lower Mudan. Mudan. Well, again, I'm probably pronouncing everything wrong, but you know, what else is new? Scene two, the life of the pure. And even gives a little map of what is going on in that particular area. Play gives places like the entrance of Madark's Lair, Sacrificial Well, Higher Mudan, Ways to Lower Mudan, Spiritual Forest, etc, etc. Scene three is the investigations of the village. And then there's the, the map of Higher 
moved on. So we're gonna move on. I don't wanna spend all my time on the acts because there are three acts in total and each one of these has, you know, three to six scenes. So this is again, a very in-depth campaign that you would have to take a lot of time to do, which is great. I mean, that's, that's how you get into the game. And then it even has an epilogue on how to finish the campaign and I you know I don't want to spoil it for you but uh, it basically uh, once that ends you can then move on to your own story and maybe take one of the canvases and uh, start from there. Chapter 4 is the figures of the Tricastle. These are NPCs that you may be able to encounter um, as well as uh, the different types of characters that, um, or classes, I guess, that they are. For example, it says Magientus, Knight, Renegade, Bard, etc. Presentation of their features include technical characteristics, descriptions, rumor, personality, and a secret. So many protagonists are concerned with the secrets that are mentioned in a special paragraph. Sometimes these secrets are information that the figures will keep to themselves to the bitter end. Others, in other cases, they do not even know if this is a secret existence, or only have partial knowledge of it. If there is no such paragraph, this does not imply that the figure in question has no secrets. Rather, it is left for the leader to invent one or more. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is something to get your characters interested in one another is to have them all write individual secrets about themselves. One true, one false, and one about someone else and have them spread them around to other people. So for example, uh, a secret about me that is true is uh, my natural hair dye, my natural hair color is brown. I mean, it's pretty obvious by my roots right now, but whatever. The false secret is that um, I am, I play the trumpet. And then a, a secret about someone else is that uh, dad is uh, naturally bald and doesn't shave his head. <laughs> That is a false rumor, but it's something about, you know, someone else. And then you would spread those around and it becomes something that can spice up the campaign. So the fact that they include that in these NPCs, is pretty awesome. And then it even gives like a, you know, creating your own figure. So if you wanted to create your own NPC, because eventually you'll have to as the leader, it tells you how. So let's take a gander at some of these characters. Uh, la la la. We're gonna go with Argala the Devourer. She sounds pretty cool. Um, she is a female, she is a Telkaride, Telkaride, I don't know, 36 years old, and then more kale. Uh, she has competitive, combativeness of three, creativity of three, empathy of four, reason of one, conviction of four. Remember, all these stats are pretty low compared to, uh, let's say, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. Um, I, love, I think it keeps it simpler that way. Not as much math. Um, Close Combat is 4, De Martin Mysteries is 5, she knows Herbalism, Meditation, Sigil Run, um, Feats is 4, Natural Environment 5, Perception 4, Relations 5, plus 1 bonus. Um, she's charismatic and good health, she is slow, um, she has a sanity with a mental resistance of 9, Orientation is addictive, and Trauma 8. Oh, she has Call Animals, Healing Poison, Vegetation Growth, and Withering, which is Ogham. I guess that's spells? I did my research before this, but I have apparently not retained any of it. With a good-hearted expression on her face, Argala comes across a cheerful, red-faced countrywoman. Not as the corrupt... not as a corrupted De Martin. The small village of Gilloir Dukedom, where she lives, Jarnel, is completely under her thumb just like it was under her mother's and her grandmother's before her. And with three generations spent under the yoke of Morkel, the villagers have forgotten the actual meaning of traditions. She is only, she and only she determines who will have the right to hunt, fish, and cultivate. So, she sounds like a big baddie. Probably someone that you would have to use as a antagonist. Uh, in order to get your game going. I'm not gonna go too much into that or anyone else, just because these are characters that you can add into your game and make them make the game a little more interesting. I mean, they're here for you to use, so why not use them? Oh, we also have Liriel, the finery. She is female, uh, the Palkaride, 23 years old, and a bard. I think she's very pretty. 
but that's the point of her character. She's supposed to be very pretty. But she is someone who has a, a dark secret that there is darkness within her. Even though she's a remarkable young woman who has a reputation that abounds, um, there is a dark secret to her that many, many would fear. So the next part of that is the... Uh, we're gonna skip over the rest of the characters. Um, more information that you can look up yourself and get really into because, again, there's a lot of information here. Chapter 5, which is the final chapter of the book, is a bestiary. They cover some animals in the chapter, or the book one, and I believe. Um, this is actually more of like animal companions and the like. Animals that you would just find around, uh, or at least in the first page, just find around the, the ways, uh, for example, cats or crows or horses or snakes or spiders or wolves. It kind of gives, it has a, a list of information, a nice little chart of information that can help you play your animal to its best ability. Um, for example, if you're having a bear attack, it has an attack of 12, damage of 3, so on and so forth. It even has special abilities. For example, the bear has rage, and the rat has disease, uh, the snake and spider have venom, things that you can incorporate into your story. And then it actually gives a few different uh, created beasts to really liven up your your campaign. For example, the Loxium, Sneom, I can do it, Sneov, Loxniov is how I think it's pronounced. Um, let's take a gander at the pronunciation guide. Loxniom, it, it's probably supposed to be pronounced Sneov. Uh, M-H in Gaelic, I believe, is a V noise, but they have it Sneom in the pronunciation guide, so I don't know. This is the sea worm. Uh, silent and powerful, the sea worm is a water predator feared of all tricastles fishermen, as it would be. So that's something that can uh, make your sailing life a little more difficult. Um, it has vampire bats, the mud crawler, um, the poison plant. All of these have their individual names also. I'm just not spending time on learning the pronunciation for them. So yeah, the Medark. Uh, these are the, the lady fear patients. Ooh, she's cool. She looks like an int that got too mad <laughs> and was just fed up with the world. There's a bunch of different monsters that you can include in your campaign. And then it goes into the index, which um, is just a bunch of pronunciation guides and where to find the pages. So, that is the Shadows of Estrin Travels book. Um, I think it is very thorough, just like the original and the... Uh, prologue book, which is Zero. I honestly love this RPG system. It is so interesting that they went with a more gritty, realistic, and dark uh, aspect of games that is often overlooked because when you go through fantasy games, you're often experiencing it for the mystical magicalness of it. And often overlooked is the dark, murderous intent <laughs> of games that can often happen. So uh, I think this is a very uh, necessary part of the game. Like you can have your Shadows of Estrin series, your RPG system, your campaign with just the original book and it will get along just fine. But this is definitely something that would help the newbie or the inexperienced or someone who is looking for a little more story, especially direction if they need it. Um, so I'm gonna give this book a solid five out of five because, I mean, there's a lot of information in here that you can use to make your, your campaigns just that much more interesting. Um, check it out, get it for yourself at their website. Um, I'll be sure to link that below. Um, and in the meantime, I am Lyric with the Dwarven Tavern, wishing for you to want for nothing but adventure. And at first I feared it, then I charged. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.